Gargoyles, Millennium Sorrow, performed by Marina Sirtis, written by Whitney Young. Prologue. Perhaps this story begins when a gargoyle is resurrected in a castle among the clouds. With only a few surviving members of his family, he awakens to a strange new world where sorcery is called science and the lights of the Forbidden City shine brighter than the day. The creature only brings with him his grief, his rage, and his sense of order to the chaotic city where crime and avarice are rampant. He will defend his new home to his last breath. Or perhaps the story began long ago, when a medieval knight stood by and watched Viking invaders slaughter the gargoyles he had sworn to protect. The gentle creatures were more than his compatriots, they were his family. And yet, when the crucial moment arrived, he remained silent. The knight told himself that it wasn't his fault. He had never intended them to die. In fact, he had schemed and plotted in an attempt to allow the gargoyles to usurp the humans. But events can lay waste to the most intricate of plans. As their stone bodies were reduced to rubble, all that remained was the knight's enduring cowardice, for he had traded dozens of lives for a few more hours of fleeting life. But perhaps long before the rage and betrayal, the story began earlier still, with a boy and a girl and the deceptively placid waves of the North Sea. Perhaps it began with an act of determination or was it an act of friendship? Or maybe something more tender? In any event, no good deed ever goes unpunished. Protruding from the roof of the sea, two giant bat-like wings flapped with every ounce of strength they possessed. The claws on the tips of the wings slashed and ripped through the night in a desperate attempt to cling to a cliff or a shoal. But the young gargoyle was too far out. Under the surface, the boy was panicking. He opened his mouth to call for help, but salt water flooded his mouth and nostrils. He kicked and scratched for freedom, but the tides of the North Sea had no intention of letting him escape. As the tip of his wings faded from view, a dark blue streak dived into the undulating darkness. Salt water burned the girl's eyes, but she forced herself to keep them open. She saw her purpose friend. He grabbed her shoulders, his talon-like feet kicked her in the shin, and his claws pierced her skin as he held her shoulders in a death grip. She tried to pull away, but the boy was too strong. She cried out, trying to tell the boy to let go, but only a garbled wail shivered through the current. The boy pulled her towards him. He wrapped his arms around her neck in a fatal embrace. She could barely make out his undulating black hair, for the darkness of the sea was becoming more profound. A jagged rock pressed into her foot, and she realised she was at the ocean's floor. Her head felt like someone had put it in a vice. Fearing it might explode like a bug beneath a boot, she looked at the boy, but his eyes were shut. His grip had relented, his body was limp, only undulating slightly with the currents. It was only then that she considered that her act of determination might have put her in danger. Dad, I'd never said the sea was this dangerous, she thought to herself. Her father was the bravest, most powerful gargoyle in the world. He had numerous adventures with sailors, brigands and marauders. He wasn't afraid of the ocean, but she had never seen her father swim. Could he have perished in waters such as these? No, not her dad, aid. And yet why couldn't she defeat the ocean's waves? As she sank deeper, 
the impossibility of her demise suddenly became increasingly inevitable. As the pressure was too much for her body to handle, and with the little oxygen left burning in her chest, she knew she and the boy would both drown. She prayed to the human god and wished gargoyles had an all-powerful spirit who could rescue them. A faint green light glimmered before her. At first the girl thought it might be her mind playing tricks on her rather than the divine intervening. But the light grew brighter and expanded into a glowing orb. An image came to her mind. She saw the most beautiful gargoyle in the world. Her face was fair like a human princess. Her peppermint skin was smooth, warm and dry and her luscious wings, which were comprised of real feathers, reached up towards the heavens. Mother? the girl queried the ocean. The light faded, and the girl was alone, and still unable to breathe. She concluded that the moonlight was only reflecting off some seaweed. Nevertheless, adrenaline had kicked in. She no longer noticed the stinging in her eyes or the invisible anvil pressing into her skull. If she wanted to lead the gargoyles one day, she knew she had to be fearless, just like her parents. The sea may have pulled her into its bosom, but she wasn't going to stay there. She tucked her wings close to her body. She pulled the boy close to her and folded his wings around his body. She wrapped her arms around the boy's scrawny torso. She exhaled the last bit of oxygen from her lungs, sank a bit further, and pressed both feet against the rocky ocean floor. She squatted and felt the jagged rocks drill into her foot, but ignored the pain and lunged upward with all her might. With all the strength she mustered, using the adrenaline to her advantage, she kicked fast strides towards the surface. With a clenched jaw, she ignored the burning in her chest and kept going. She couldn't give up now. She and the boy were moving upward, but the moon was still invisible. A sharp cramp stabbed her right leg, and the sensation of her burning lungs and the pressure in her head rushed back in. The pain seemingly grabbed her leg and dragged her down a little. She remembered the paddles humans used in ships. Rather than claw at the waves, she would use her free hand like a paddle. She kicked with her feet and scooped the water down with her hand. She realized that she could use her wings as paddles too, like the great oars on boats. She cautiously extended her wings only halfway and flapped them under the water. The currents resisted her beating wings, but it gave her a bit more momentum. The light from the moon emerged, but it was too far for her to feel any sense of optimism. Her entire body pulsed to her overworked heartbeat, and her lungs gave out. The urge to breathe was unbearable. The moonlight, once a welcoming guide to freedom, now made her dizzy. The pain was everywhere, as if she was being turned inside out. Mother, please help me. But no green light appeared. She realized if she let the boy go, she might just survive. No one would blame her for his death. She would have done all that she could. But as she regarded her unconscious friend, she knew she couldn't let him go. That kind of cowardice was a human trait, not worthy of a gargoyle. She pressed through the pain, the cramps, the gash in her foot, and the pressure in her head. Her steadily darkening vision narrowed on the blurry light of the moon. She struggled to remain conscious, forcing all of her focus on being able to reach that light. Her body no longer felt like it was her own, as if her spirit had stepped outside of her mortal shell just to lighten the load. Suddenly, 
Her hand broke the surface. She'd made it. She clawed at the air desperately, her mouth instinctively opening to take a breath, but she was still underwater. She choked, her vision finally going dark, but she refused to give in now. With one final push of her wings, her head rose above the water, neck strained with how much she tried to keep from sinking back down. She coughed out the water, nose burning as she expelled salt water from her nostrils and throat. She swallowed and then heaved in and in and in. She wiped the burning water from her eyes and she could see the night clearly once again. The moon, the stars and Castle Wyvern in the distance. With another breath, she grabbed the boy's neck and pulled his head above the waves. Unlike her, he was not gasping for life. She hugged him close and kicked the waves. She tried to push herself to the shore, but the currents had other plans. The castle in the distance was getting smaller. She kicked and kicked, but the castle only shrank from view. She looked around wildly and noticed they were drifting quickly towards a large sea stack. It cut a jagged figure as it jutted out of the sea, like a giant broken spear. The rock she had so desperately prayed for moments ago was now on a collision course. She tried to paddle away, but it kept getting closer. She held the boy close and braced herself. She felt her wings snap as she crashed backwards into the barnacle stone. The few breaths of air she had managed to acquire were quickly knocked out of her body. She screamed in pain, but the sound was lost against the loud crashing of water against rock. She didn't let the boy go. She used her tail to press herself away from the rock, and the tides continued to carry the gargoyles away. She held the boy so close her lips touched his long black mane. Her arms grew numb from the strain. She wanted to let go. No, that's not what gargoyles do. She kept breathing and kicking, trying to keep both her head and the boys above water. With the castle out of sight, the sea relented. The currents abated and began to push her and the boy towards the shore. She kicked, scooped, and tried to wag her tail. And when her foot pressed into the sand below, relief washed over her. She fell to the ground and resisted the urge to kiss the wet sand. She crawled away, fearful that a mystical tendril of water might emerge to drag her back in. But the surface of the sea now seemed placid. Perhaps it decided that the lesson it taught them was sufficient, for it then began pushing the lifeless boy onto the shore. She grabbed his arms and dragged him away from the serene waves, which left a trail of foam over their bodies. She grunted as she pulled. The boy was a lot heavier than she imagined, but she pulled until the sand became rocky, ensuring the boy was well past even the shallowest of currents. She shook the boy's shoulders. Wake up, wake up! But he remained listless. She squatted over him, pressing her face mere inches from his. Why won't you breathe? She slapped his face, but his head only lolled to the side. She remembered a story her father told her about human brigands, who often were close to drowning. Humans punched each other in the chest when they were drowning. And so she would do the same. She balled up her fist and punched his chest. But the boy's tough skin barely moved. She struck him again and again. But he remained lifeless. Or was it the belly? She stood up, raised her uninjured foot, and slammed it as hard as she could down onto his stomach. The boy's eyes opened. He sat up and tried to gasp for air, but only vomited seawater. He rolled over and retched the remaining sea from his lungs. Just for good measure, she began to thump him on the back with her tail. Hey! 
he raised his hand to stop the girl's torrent of blows. He turned around and glared at her. There was no gratitude in his eyes. That hurts. Well, it's a lot better than drowning. I just saved your life. The girl realized that followers never really appreciated a good leader. What were you thinking? You could have died, she said, feigning an adult's waning forbearance towards a wayward child. I was just trying to fish, he protested between gasps for air. Don't you know gargoyles aren't meant to go in the water? That's why we have wings. We're meant to fly, not swim. But then she remembered one crucial detail. Except my dad aid. He swam with sailors, I think. The boy gave the girl a suspicious look. Gargoyles don't have fathers. All the grown-ups are our parents. It would take too long to explain her situation to the boy, who was obviously not very bright. The girl folded her arms in exasperation. You're such an eejit. What's an eejit? The boy asked before coughing again. It's a human word. It means slow, stupid and not very smart. Like gargoyles who try to swim in the sea. I've done it before, the boy groused. He tried to stand, but his legs seemed wobbly. The girl went to help him, but he pushed her away, determined to refuse any further assistance she might offer. I've always caught plenty of fish before. His eyes narrowed and he pointed at the girls accusatorily. Maybe it's you. You're new here and you're just bad luck. The sea was perfectly calm tonight. I went to find fish to eat like always. Don't you know anything? My father says the waves are most dangerous the night after a storm. When the storm rages above the ocean, it rages below the next day. She scoffed with a high and imperious tone. She turned away from the boy and marched toward the castle. But the cramp in her right leg and the gash in her right foot meant that she could only limp. Oh, she heard the boy say from behind. He easily caught up with her. Your wing, it looks broken. She winced as the broken bone in her left wing throbbed, reminding her of how injured she really was. It's fine. Nothing the sun won't cure. Besides, I just saved your life. I'm the best bit of luck you've ever had. The boy paused as if mulling what to say next. After an awkward pause, a smile crept across his face. Well, maybe next time I'll save you. <laughs> she scoffed at the preposterous idea and turned back toward the castle. The blackness of the night was turning to violet, which meant the dawn was approaching. Her furrowed brow was replaced with wide, fearful eyes. The sun's coming up. We won't have enough time to get back to the castle. So? Such an Egypt, this one. The humans, if they see us in stone form, they might smash us, she said with great concern. He batted away her concerns with a wave of his hand. No, they won't. We help them guard the castle. And what if pirates happen to attack the castle today? They won't be too happy to see us. The boy cogitated on that for a moment and his face lit up. Follow me, I know a place. And as if he hadn't just had a brush with death, the boy took off running. His large, talon-like feet carried him far ahead of the girl. Her broken body kept her from keeping pace. Hey, wait for me, she called out. The boy turned back. Do you want me to carry you, he offered. The girl couldn't decipher whether or not he was making a joke at her expense, but he wrapped his arms around her waist and lifted her off the ground. His rough jostling only exacerbated the pain. Ow, that hurts. Put, just, just put me down, she yelped. She squirmed in his hold until he sat her down. I was just trying to be like the knights in the stories. Yes, the knights saved the princesses, but not after the princesses had already saved them first. 
This was clearly just his attempt to get even or pretend that him carrying her on a beach was the same as her braving the ocean depths to save his life. And yet, as she looked into his sullen face, the girl felt her anger sublimate. She wasn't sure what to say. Just, just don't run too fast. He took a bow, flinging his wing over his shoulder like a high-born nobleman might do a cape. If I can't be a knight, I can be a gentleman, he said, offering his hand to her. For a moment, the girl felt flattered. She took hold of his hand and together the two walked along the beach. She looked back at the boy. His face was chiselled. Yes, his body was gangly, but at least he had a strong jawline. The water seemed so calm from a distance, a deceptive appearance hiding how deadly it truly was. On the horizon, violet began to bleed across the black sky as night started its retreat. The girl knew that humans often found peace and tranquility with this kind of view, but she could never see it the way they did. To her, the sun meant vulnerability. Though as she watched blue begin to creep into the violet as the sky lightened further, she couldn't help but acknowledge that the view wasn't completely unpleasant. The two hobbled together along the beach hand in hand. Between them was silence, but it wasn't awkward or heavy. The sounds of the world slowly waking up were enough to fill it for them. Impulsively, she gave his hand a small squeeze, almost stumbling when he squeezed back. They reached the base of one of the cliffs. In here, the boy said, pointing to his secret hideout. The cliffs of the coast gave way to a small crevice, which presented an opening just large enough for two young gargoyles to enter single file. The girl limped cautiously inside, the opening narrowed the further back she and the boy ventured. The cave was cold and forbidding, like the dark throat of some great earthen beast. Bumpy bits of mica glistened in the darkness like studded teeth, and the craggy walls and low ceiling seemed to the girl to be waiting to swallow her whole. Here she could neither run nor glide, had she leapt from the jaws of a water monster to those of a rocky one? And as if reading her thoughts, the boy turned to her. Don't worry, no one knows about this place. I've been coming here since I learned to fly. The girl met his eyes warily and was met with a look of reassurance. His smile didn't seem so stupid anymore. She turned around and faced the entrance, standing on the balls of her talons and outstretching her claws. The pain in her foot pulsated again, so she pressed her tail to the ground in order to take the pressure off the injured foot. She held up her claws as if ready to attack. She tried to put on her most ferocious scowl and she opened her mouth and hissed. <laughs> what are you doing? The boy scratched his head. Hush, I need to concentrate so I can greet the sun with ferocity and strength. <sighs> the boy scratched his head in confusion. Why? In case the pirates show up. If I'm scary enough, they'll run away and that will give us enough time. She took another deep breath and hissed, giving any human ne'er-do-wells a clear warning that she was dangerous. Oh, the boy said sheepishly. He stood next to her and then held up his hands like she did, letting out a drawn-out hiss sail past his fangs. Then she hissed again, then him, then her. This is stupid. We obviously have a few more minutes before the dawn. The sky isn't even orange yet, he said, pointing to the sky. He added, Wouldn't it be wonderful to see the sun just one time? I'd love to see it in all its glory. Well, we can see the beginning and the end. That's something, she offered. 
She momentarily confused herself as to why she felt like changing her opinion just to try and soothe his worries about never being able to see the sun. I guess so, the boy said, turning his gaze back towards the girl. His longing for the sun was now beaming towards her. She didn't understand his face. The girl thought he was up to something mischievous and she instinctively stepped back. He took two steps towards her. Her tail pressed the side of the cave. She could go no further. The boy closed his eyes, leaned in and pressed his lips to hers. The girl stood there in shock, eyes wide open, unsure of what was happening. At first she thought maybe he was checking to see if she was breathing. But once the boy's tongue pressed into her mouth, she wanted to retch. She shoved him away as hard as she could. Ooh! What was that? He stumbled back at her shove, tripping over a rock and almost falling. He caught himself just in time. His expression turned mullish, mouth turned down sullenly. His disappointment was palpable. It was supposed to be a kiss. That's not a kiss, she said, her tone coloured with genuine sincerity. Yes, it is, he shot back defensively. I saw the humans doing it last night. Oh, a human kiss, the girl said, now comprehending the odd choice of behaviour. Not only was the boy too stupid to go fishing when the tides were raging, but he also knew nothing of gargoyle romance. This boy needed help, a lot of it. That's not how gargoyles kiss, she explained. What if I had a long beak? But you don't. But I could. Lots of our kind do, so it's not fair to them, she lectured. Here, this is how my father said that gargoyles are meant to kiss. The girl held up two of her fingers. She pressed the two fingers to her own lips and then pressed her fingers to his lips. And then they hug, she added for good measure. She stepped towards the boy and leaned her head on his scrawny chest. The boy was a few inches taller than she was, but she wasn't about to tell him that. The boy put his arm around her and his wings enveloped them both. I still like the human way better, he added. He looked up at the approaching dawn and realised time was almost out. He leaned in and pecked her on the lips. The girl opened her mouth to descent while beams of light crept into the cavern. She could feel her body hardening, her appendages changing to stone. She hated her hibernation more than she hated the sea. It was always so sudden and so violent in the way it took her freedom from her. The only good thing about the sun's hibernation process was that it healed gargoyles of most minor injuries. When she awoke that night, her foot and wing would be healed. But to be completely vulnerable for half of each and every day, the price seemed too high. How she had prayed for a place where there was no sun, a place where she could fly freely for as long as she wanted, maybe a place without any humans at all, a place where she didn't have to worry about gargoyles disappearing or being smashed while they hibernated. A place where even a girl could lead them. But her hopes and dreams were only ever answered with morning rays of imprisonment. She may have escaped the clutches of the raging ocean, but she would never escape the terrible dawn. She looked back to the boy, whose smarmy grin had been replaced with a thoughtful resoluteness. He didn't seem at all afraid of either the sun or the pirates. But was it bravery or stupidity? Despite his irritating shortcomings, she found herself strangely drawn to his confidence. He took one last look at the girl and smiled offering her silent comfort in that final moment. She looked down, and the dawn had already turned her feet, tail and legs to stone. The wave of ossification crept upward, congealing everything the light touched. 
and with her last bit of strength, she swung her arms around his torso and squeezed as hard as she could. She tucked her head into his chest and closed her eyes, praying that the pirates wouldn't find them that day. Gargoyles, Millennium Sorrow, Chapter 3 Performed by Marina Sirdis, written by Whitney Young on the elevator ride up to the 34th floor of Renard Industries, Demona stared at her human facade in the reflective surface of the wall. She realised her lipstick needed a touch-up. She reached into her breast pocket and pulled out a tube and leaned forward to apply it. She hated these vainglorious activities. Those reserved for human females were particularly tedious, but if she was going to play the role of a human CEO, she had to look the part. Part of this role was hearing the propositions of other egotistical executives, including the aged and infirm Halcyon Renard. He had said his mysterious proposal would be lucrative, but she wondered whether this might be some desperate plea to learn the secret of her immortality. Demona smacked her lips to spread the colour evenly and tilted her head this way and that. Renard wouldn't be the first dying man to come to her for help. There was something satisfying about watching men who held power, which they inevitably acquired by stepping on the backs of others, wither and decay. There was no substitute for the loss of hope in their eyes when they finally realised that all the money in the world couldn't actually save them from the ravages of time. She wasn't exactly sure whether Halcyon Renard knew Dominique Destine was merely a daytime alter ego for the immortal gargoyle. She concluded that Xanatos must have told him. After all, David Xanatos was married to Halcyon's only child, Fox Renard. Xanatos may have promised Amona that he would never reveal her true identity to any human, but his promises were as reliable as words carved into the sand of a shoreline. She wondered if the old man intended to blackmail her. He might threaten to reveal her secret if she didn't help him live forever. If so, Demona would kill him on the spot for the barefaced cheek of threatening her. But perhaps he might be willing to offer me something. Not that the old man has anything I need. Demona knew she was a powerful sorceress, but her own attempts at granting others immortality had never gone according to plan. She resurrected her murdered gargoyle brother, Coldstone, using a blend of magic and modern technology, but the phenomenon inadvertently trapped three personalities inside one mechanical body, driving her brother quite insane. Then there was Goliath. She had literally hundreds of attempts to resurrect him and the rest of their gargoyle clan from their millennial sleep. None had been successful. Not that it was her fault. Goliath wasn't dead. He was just trapped by a particularly pernicious spell. What about Niccolo? She had trapped Machiavelli's soul inside a copy of his own book. He was literally a shadow of the adept bureaucrat turned political philosopher from the Renaissance, existing only in the pages of his great work. She had vowed never to curse anyone like that again, save maybe a few select enemies who had earned an eternity of hell. Maybe she could confine the old man's soul to that ridiculously opulent wheelchair he cruised around in. But such a fate was too cruel, even for her. The elevator door chimed and she was pulled from her machinations. Standing in front of her was an extremely chipper young woman with bright frizzy carrot top hair. Right this way, Miss Destine, the girl said with a thick Irish accent. The Irish girl led Demona through a maze of laboratories. A slight whiff of sulphur hung in the air. It's such an honour to meet you. I could never imagine a woman from a Scottish Highlands making her fortune here, in New York City. Demona stopped and glared at the girl, who was a head shorter than herself. How do you know where I'm from? Demona asked, sizing the girl up with narrow eyes. If Halcyon had divulged Demona's secret to this little trollop, 
neither he nor the girl would be long for this world. The girl reached into a large manila folder and pulled out a copy of the New Yorker magazine where Dominique Destine was featured on the cover. Demona snatched the magazine and remembered how her PR team had coaxed her into giving an interview to some human journalist. She looked powerful and in control as she leaned over her desk, her knuckles digging into the mahogany wood. You're my idol, the girl offered. I want to be just like you. I mean, not exactly like you. You're Scottish, I'm Irish, but we're both Celtic and we have so much in common. Two foreign women paving our way in the Big Apple. I'm Chiara, Chiara Doyle. The young woman extended her hand, but Demona only offered a forced smile in response. She turned and continued to walk down the hall, although she had no idea where she was going. Chiara scurried back up to Demona's side and motioned for Demona to walk through one final door. Demona entered the laboratory where Halcyon Renard and the Xanatos couple were all waiting. Ah, Dee, we've been waiting for you. It's good to see you so early in the morning, Xanatos said with a devilish half-grin. Dee, morning. They were hints that only the two of them would understand. It was his way of letting her know that he could divulge her secret to anyone in the room. She wanted to slap the smug bastard, but then she caught sight of Halcyon Renard, who seemed oblivious to Xanatos' jibe. So, he doesn't know that I'm a gargoyle, Demona concluded. Halcyon's sleek, egg-shaped wheelchair seemingly hovered its way right up to Demona. Balding, shriveled and covered in liver spots, the old man extended his hand to the gargoyle in disguise, but his decrepitude was an affront to her dignity. She folded her arms, blatantly ignoring the gesture. Why am I here? Suddenly, a wave of pinpricks surged through her skin. At first, she thought it was her revulsion to the old man's appearance. Then she heard something inaudible, quieter than a whisper. She looked up and saw a large white sword placed on a mantle. The large sword was at least four feet long, including the hilt. Although confined by black iron bars that sizzled with electric currents, the blade's metallic shine wasn't dimmed. It resembled ivory, with silver accents that adorned the heart of the weapon. As Demona peered closer, she could see there were words engraved along the side of the blade, although she couldn't make them out from where she was. What is that? she inquired. That is the reason I brought you all here today, the old man's voice rasped from his cracked, thin, blue lips. So, what's so special about this sword? his daughter asked. My team acquired it in Asia, but from what I can tell, it was forged in Eastern Europe. The legend states that the locals called this sword Ishten Ulu, which is rough Hungarian translation for a sword that can vanquish the gods. They say that it was used to vanquish Elizabeth Bathory, otherwise known as Lady Dracula, the scourge of the Austrian Empire. Demona couldn't help but scoff derisively. That story is nonsense because I killed Lady Dracula and her husband, Demona wanted to say. At the time, she had killed the Bathories for revenge. She had never considered that perhaps the humans under their reign might view their killer as a saviour. Not that she would have had any use for the adulation of Hungarian peasants, but it was so typical of humans to take credit for the deeds of others. Demona mentally shook herself out of this train of thought, but her confidence in this supposed magical sword was quickly diminishing. What does this god-killer sword actually do, other than kill vampires, of course? Well, legend is just that. A legend. But my scientists began experimenting on it, and they've made an important discovery. One that will change the world. He then broke contact and nodded to Chiara, 
who dutifully walked to the very back of the room. A look of fear was etched across her face as she shakily put on a pair of protective goggles. Demona's instinct was to follow suit, but her pride wouldn't let her move. She waited until David and Fox were both staring at the old man before taking one small step back, then another. Watch this, Halcyon said with the excitement of a child. He waved to Kiara and she picked up a large remote control. With the press of a button, the electric bars guarding the sword descended to the floor. Although two mounting hooks kept the sword in place, Demona could swear it was levitating. Kiara pressed another button and the sword's mantle began to hum. The hooks turned from gunmetal to bright red as they heated up. As the sword consumed the heat, thin, sapphire-colored beams of light emitted from the blade in every direction, and the surrounding air shimmered like a mirage over a desert. The Ishtenulu gives off a unique form of radiation, Halcyon explained while raising his withered finger into the air. Dad, it's radioactive, Fox yelled in disbelief. Xanatos's supposedly fearless wife raced to the back of the room to Kiara. The young Irish girl handed her boss's daughter another pair of goggles. Fox looked at the goggles sceptically. Is this going to be enough? Don't worry, it's not harmful, Renard implored, and his wheelchair glided towards the sword. That's easy for you to say. You don't have long to live anyway, Demona quipped. Xanatos gave her a look as if he were chastising his disobedient son. Quite the opposite, actually, the old man said. He reached out to the hilt, and the mantle lowered itself to meet the old man's reach. He grabbed the handle, but he was too weak to lift it. Not that it mattered. Demona could see how touching the sword alone was enough to make the old man feel young and able. He smiled and nodded again at his assistant. Kiara pressed another button and this time a set of two metallic pincers lowered from the ceiling. With a loud clang, the pincers grabbed hold of both ends of the long blade, causing the sword to shimmer at the touch. The humming intensified and the light from the blade expanded. Pulses of electricity rippled through the metallic claws, crackling up them and into the ceiling. The lights in the lab became blinding, causing several bulbs to burst and shatter from the ferocity, but the room's illumination remained blinding. Demona squinted her eyes at the radiant lights. Even in human form, she hated brightness. But Xanatos and Halcyon remained fixated on the sword, eyes wide open. At once, all of the electronic contraptions in the lab came to life. It was as if the sword had created a veritable Lilliputian revolt among all the electronic devices in the lab. Robotic arms flailed about, knocking glass beakers to the floor. Computer screens flickered various colors as they glitched and malfunctioned. But the chaos was drowned out by the sword's increasing hum. The hairs on Demona's neck stood straight up. She felt her heart begin to race, accelerating to the point that it started to twinge in pain. As her mouth went dry as sand, her attitude charred. She could barely muster enough strength in her neck to look over at Xanatos, who watched the chaos with an impish grin and no signs of physical afflictions. Demona felt the pit in her stomach deepen, like a hole was opening up and her logical thought was falling into it. It wasn't a feeling she was used to. It was fear. With what little strength she had left, she turned to Kiara. Her eyes pleaded for relief. As if the young girl could sense the pain in Demona's eyes, she pressed the remote, and the metallic pincers detached from the sword and darted back up to the ceiling. The room remained bright, but the gadgets powered down in a decrescendo. Demona lifted her foot and stepped cautiously away. 
She could feel her hands trembling uncontrollably at her sides, so she crossed her arms to hide it. What just happened? Xanatos asked without a hint of fear or doubt. As Miss Destine pointed out, I'm not long for this world. I've been thinking a lot about Alex, and what kind of world are we going to leave behind for him and his generation? If I can't give him a better world than the one I was born into, then what's the point? All this money and technology, what's it for if we only use it to enrich ourselves? It's not like we can take it with us. And so you've discovered that this sword is some sort of power source? Xanatos asked. The sword is made from a rare form of uranium, Halcyon clarified. Like what they use in nuclear bombs? Fox yelled, becoming apoplectic. No. Well, yes, but... Dad, you did not just bring me and my husband into your lab and expose us all to nuclear radiation. Calm down now. What do you take me for? My scientists have been studying this artifact for months. The radiation emits, whilst powerful, doesn't ionize like beta or gamma rays. Everyone silently stared at Halcyon as if trying to comprehend his words, so he continued. That means rather than breaking down the backbone of your DNA, it actually enhances it. It's an entirely new form of radiation. We were going to call it Omega Rays, but that sounded a bit too ominous. We're debating between Kappa or Epsilon. Xanatos approached the sword. He extended his hand, but he looked down to Renard as if to double-check that touching it would be safe. The old man nodded. Go ahead. You'll be fine. Xanatos attempted to lift the sword up with one hand, but it was too heavy. Using both hands, he pried it from its perch. He swung it through the air a few times and he grinned. Halcyon beamed with pride at Xanatos' juvenile display. I've been working with my scientists around the clock for months, trying to reverse engineer the refining process. And you've done it? You've actually created a clean form of nuclear energy? Almost. Almost? Fox repeated sceptically. I promise it's completely safe, but I realized that I need your help. How? Fox asked. Xanatos placed the sword back into place, then slid his fingers along the flat side of the glowing white blade. It means, Fox, that your father is on the cusp of creating a new source of energy, one that could be more powerful than anything on the planet. Think of the possibilities. No more nuclear waste. No more Chernobyls, the old man hypothesized. And fossil fuels? Digging for gasoline, burning coal, fracking. They'll all go the way of the dinosaur once we provide the world with a cleaner alternative. Xanatos smirked while he continued stroking the sword, the gleam in his eyes almost reverent. That's exactly why I asked you here. Renard Industries mostly deals with R&D, but Xanatos Industries... You've got the market share, the name recognition. You're the one with the charisma and leadership that will usher in a new era for the world. Demona thought David's head might explode from all the flattery. Then why am I here? she demanded. Don't you see, Dominique? Of all our companies, Nightstone is the only one with significant links to the energy sector. You have holdings in Russia and the Middle East, not to mention all of your government contracts. Demona glared at Xanatos for grasping Renard's plan faster than she did. Imagine what that will do for global poverty. Everyone will have equal access to energy. Countries won't have to fight over resources and fuels. We could build a better world together. Halcyon said, his arms waving around in excitement. I like the sound of that, Xanatos said. 
but the unspoken truth was glaringly apparent. They'd all become the richest people in the world. Have you sketched any projections? Oh, I've got some, came the thick Irish accent. Everyone looked, and Chiara was holding up her plain manila envelope. I printed everything out because the computers don't work after a surge. The girl laid the printed plans out over a table at the back of the room, and Xanatos and Renard went to examine them. Demona stared at the sword. She felt entranced, the shine of its sharp blade almost beckoning her like a siren call. She approached and reached out her hand to grab it, but pain jolted through her body. She looked down at her hand, horrified. The once pale, pink, human flesh was decaying, peeling away to reveal her familiar gargoyle steel blue. She instinctively cradled her arm and jumped back from the sword, unable to stop a fierce growl of pain. Once the pain dulled into a slow throb, she looked up to see everyone staring at her. Are you all right, Miss Destine? I thought you said the sword's radiation is harmless, Demona snapped. Let me see. Halcyon said as he took her hand in his. Immediately, her hand had reverted to its youthful appearance and she yanked it away from his decrepit fingers. Hmm. You look fine to me. <laughs> Maybe you're a vampire. Demona's voice became tight with controlled anger. Do you think this is a joke? She leaned over Renard. He was so weak and helpless in his little robotic cradle. All she had to do was reach in and smother him. Her hand slithered towards the old man's neck. Demona! Xanatos said sternly, placing a staying hand on her shoulder. She jerked away from his grip. I'm sure this is all a bit overwhelming. Perhaps you need time to consider my father's proposal. Xanatos said while manoeuvring himself between Demona and the old man. I want nothing to do with this endeavour, Demona retorted before storming out. She turned to take one last glance at the sword and found that its shimmering blue haze was no longer a siren call but an ominous threat. She left the lab and marched to the elevator, pushing the button repeatedly. She beat down the obvious feelings of fear. She didn't know what the old man had done, but she knew it wasn't good. Miss Destine, Chiara suddenly said from behind her. Demona was startled, but she hid it behind annoyance. What do you want? Demona gave the girl her best confident posture. Mr. Renard told me to tell you that I'll email your office a number of his proposals and financial projections. I told you I'm not interested, Demona snapped while continuing to press the elevator button. When the doors opened, Demona dove in and pressed for the ground floor, but she was followed by Chiara. Is this the part where you try to change my mind? Demona asked with a huff. No, I just want to know what you're planning to do with the sword, Chiara said. I told you nothing, Demona said. She looked at the elevator display where the numbers ticked down slower by the second. You don't seem the type that does nothing, Chiara said, meeting Demona's glare with defiance. The young girl began humming a tune. It was an ancient ballad that time had long since forgotten, one that Demona recognized, although she couldn't place. Inexplicably, the elevator speakers ceased emitting soft jazz and began to play the exact same song as Chiara. Where the hell have you been? I've been trying to reach you for hours. The now blue gargoyle snarled at the fairy disguised as a blonde corporate stiff who had dared to darken her office at 1.34 a.m. I was indisposed with other matters, Owen said monotonously. He knew Demona was a powerful sorceress, and for a split second he wondered whether she had acquired the ability to read men's minds. 
As far as he was aware, that skill wasn't part of her repertoire. Nevertheless, Owen tried to suppress the memory of him taking a three-year-old infant to a rock concert. But the more he tried to suppress the memory, the more he thought of baby Alex floating over the crowd, giggling with delight. Owen could feel a small burp erupting inside him. He put his hand to his mouth and hoped Demona wouldn't notice. Do you have any idea what we're dealing with? She snarled, hands clenched into powerful fists. Of course, Owen said, meeting Demona's withering glare with an impassive look. Despite his face remaining placid, he secretly loved to see the gargoyle lose her cool, especially in response to his stoic and cryptic responses. She's so easily provoked. I love it. Owen thought to himself. So it's true. The god killer sword can kill immortals. Indubitably, Owen replied. And if that fool Halcyon Renard replicates its power source, he could build power plants all over the world. Lord Oberon would never allow that to occur. His tone was aloof, but the grave implication couldn't have been clearer. Demona sat down at her large, imposing desk and swivelled in a chair that inexplicably fit her gargoyle physique. Owen saw a disconcerting smile creep across her lips as she stared out of the massive window that overlooked the Upper East Side of Manhattan. A war between the humans and the fairies, she said contemplatively, one finger tapping at the leather of the armrest. For a moment, Owen allowed his mouth to drop open. This bird actually wants a nuclear war? Puck may have spent millennia causing mischief and mayhem, but a war that could cost millions, if not billions of lives, was not a prospect he relished, particularly one where his kind might have a chance of losing. He warned her. Don't be so confident the humans would lose. The blue gargoyle shot him a sour look. Oh? Energy is energy, whether it's created by sorcery or science. The humans already possess nuclear arsenals that I doubt any fairy could withstand. So they would destroy their own planet to stop others from ruling? Demona tilted her head as she thought about that prospect. Owen arched an eyebrow. You know they would. Does Oberon know that Renard has the sword? Owen knew that he had to choose his next words very carefully. If he said that Oberon knew of the sword and was doing nothing, she might conclude that it wasn't as dangerous as it was. If he told her that Oberon didn't know of the sword's existence, Demona might run to the fairy king in an attempt to entice him into starting a war. I am afraid that Lord Oberon no longer considers me a trusted adviser. Ah, yes, you've been removed from the royal court to guard the Queen's mongrel grandson. Demona reveled in Puck's disgrace, but at the moment it seemed to distract her from her genocidal impulses. My position notwithstanding, it would be an error to assume that gargoyles are immune to the sword's radiation. Demona turned and met his gaze. He could tell she was trying to detect deceit in his tone of voice or body language. This was why Puck adored this human form. No one could ever read him. In his mythical form as Puck, most people knew that he was a trickster, so they always expected deception. As Owen Burnett, his crisp business suit, stiff demeanour and impassive tones gave him an air of respectability which he could use to his advantage. The Ishtenulu repels magic in all of its forms. If the humans replicated its radiation, we have no idea if the radiation would harm gargoyles, whose stone hibernation contains, at least in part, elements of alchemy that no one has yet to explain. I'm sure we could adapt, Demona said. Not if you can't regenerate during the day. 
Gargoyles are currently immune to all sicknesses and diseases. The sword's radiation could be equally as poisonous to your kind as it is to mine. Demona seemed unconvinced. Of course, what good would it be for humans to be wiped off the face of the earth? And you're not around to see it. Demona raised an eyebrow. Owen knew that this gargoyle in particular hated anything that could make her look weak, to say nothing that could do genuine harm. Another wry thought entered Owen's mind, and he added, I'm sure Goliath would make a worthy leader of the post-apocalyptic gargoyles. No doubt he would preach peace and non-violence to all who would listen. Owen then noticed Demona's raised eyebrow quickly furrowed into a frown. And I'm sure the humans who will have just witnessed their entire civilization reduced to ashes would harbor no feelings of resentment against any creature associated with magic. The comment was almost sarcastic, but Demona's silence indicated to Owen that she knew that he was right. It took every bit of his self-restraint not to giggle with glee. She drew a sustaining breath and exhaled. One thing is for sure. Renard can't be allowed to replicate the sword's radiation process. In that regard, we are in complete agreement. So why not have Xanatos destroy it? Demona questioned. But before Owen could come up with a plausible response, she interjected. You don't trust him to destroy the sword, do you? Owen found himself trying to swallow a lump that had formed in his throat. Demona had no such qualms about allowing a smirk of confidence to cross her face. He noticed her blue tail wagging with excitement. Xanatos fears that Oberon might try to take Alex again. The sword is the means to destroy a threat to his family, gain dominion over the entire fairy race, and make himself the richest, most powerful human on the planet. Such an opportunity would prove far too tempting for such an ambitious man. He had worked for Xanatos for years. Owen was the closest thing to a friend that Xanatos had. And yet the fairy couldn't state that he had total confidence in Xanatos not to use the sword for his own selfish desires. Centuries ago, the humans had promised to destroy the sword in order to avoid a war with Oberon's children. They had issued platitudes to the fairy king of how they only wanted peace. Their pleas had persuaded Oberon, and yet the humans not only lied, but somehow managed to keep their deception hidden. Humans are so predictably treacherous, Owen thought to himself. But the gargoyle standing before him was no better. So, you want me to steal the sword, destroy it, and not mention to Xanatos that you denied him the ability to seize ultimate power? Summoning his best aplomb, Owen straightened his posture, brushed some lint off his shoulder, and casually responded, That would be the best outcome for all our peoples. Sounds like a good deal for you, Demona said archly. I'll do as you ask, but I will keep the sword. I can study it here at Nightstone. Perhaps my scientists can come up with a defense against the radiation. The prospect of Demona wielding such a great and powerful weapon was not ideal. But what other choice did he have? He and Demona had had various encounters over the years, and she had no great grudge against him or the fairies. In fact, he enjoyed Demona, in small doses. Owen decided to soothe his guilty conscience by telling himself that right now, Demona was the lesser of two evils. He was also aware that she knew that she owed fairies for much of her success. Titania's three handmaidens had granted her immortality nearly a millennium ago, and Anansi was the closest thing to a friend Demona had amongst the Fae, and he himself had given her the ability to turn into a human during the day. As a result, 
Owen told himself that Demona had no reason to use the sword against the immortals. I will help you acquire the sword, so long as you give me your word as a gargoyle that you will never use it to harm my kind. Owen met her gaze with all the internal strength that he could muster. And I would owe you a favor for keeping this matter entirely between us. Demona smiled like a cat with a canary in its mouth. Owen knew that she believed she had won. Perhaps in a way she had. She'd get the sword, and she'd have blackmail material that she could ruthlessly exploit. But it was a small price to pay to ensure the survival of his species. We have a deal, she said. Then unexpectedly she extended her hand to him. Owen stared at her large four talons before realising what she intended. Owen grabbed her hand and shook it with uncharacteristic gusto, eager to solidify their agreement. The fairy couldn't believe his good fortune. He had successfully manipulated the great Demona, the demon of Florence, the angel of Harlem, the most powerful gargoyle in the world. And he hadn't used magic. Merely his oratory powers of persuasion. Centuries ago, Shakespeare once told me, The man that hath a tongue, I say, is no man, if with his tongue he cannot win a woman. Boy, was that old drunkard right. Demona smiled and Owen reciprocated, although his human smile didn't quite fit his face, which caused Demona to recoil. He also remembered that Shakespeare had told him that one must always stay in character. And Owen Burnett does not smile. He dropped her hand, adjusted his glasses, and returned his facial expression to a stoic semi-frown. Owen reached into the breast pocket of his three-piece suit and pulled out a floppy disk. He walked over to the computer behind Demona's desk and inserted it. I have taken the liberty of designing you an exosuit. It should protect you from the sword's radiation. Demona activated the computer and entered her password. The image of a robotic gargoyle appeared on the screen, followed by a window that flashed over the image, indicating the status of the design. That looks like... Your brother, yes. I modified the designs for the robotic skeletons Mr. Xanatos created for Coldstone's Iago personality. When will it be ready? It should be ready by tomorrow evening. Very well. Bring it here, she commanded. Owen typed away at the keyboard. I've also taken the liberty of downloading Renard Industries' security protocols. You should find them easy enough to overcome. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have other matters to which I must attend. Owen said before turning to leave. Puck! the gargoyle called out. He turned back, a bland, questioning look on his face. I'm going to collect on that favour. Very soon. Owen gave a perfunctory nod, then departed. He approached the elevator and pressed the down button repeatedly, clicking it in a jaunty rhythm like a child. He took one last look behind him to make sure Demona hadn't followed him, before allowing his controlled features to take on a ghoulish twist. Joke's on you, lady. I can't weld my powers in this form, so unless you want to plan a magical fourth birthday for Alex, the best you can hope for is some creative accounting practices. With a soft ding, the elevator doors opened, and as he entered, Puck smiled wider than the Cheshire Cat ever could, his human features stretching almost grotesquely. He pressed the ground floor button with confidence, knowing that even if he couldn't use his powers 99% of the time, he was still the ultimate god of mischief. Once the elevator doors slid closed, he giggled to himself. Loki eats your heart out.
previously on Gargoyles Millennium Sorrow. Renowned businessman Halcyon Renard discovers a mysterious ancient sword made of uranium. When heated, the sword emits a unique form of radiation unlike anything else. Renard's son-in-law, David Xanatos, believes the radiation can be harnessed to create a new form of clean energy that will make them all the richest people on the planet. But when they invite Demona to consult on a possible power plant, she realizes that the sword in fact repels magic, causing her to wither and decay when she gets close to it. Demona arranges a secret meeting with Puck, who confirms the sword's lethality to magical creatures, including Lord Oberon and all of his children. Puck says that if Xanatos replicates the sword's radiation, he could trigger a war between humanity and the immortals. At first, Demona relishes this prospect, but Puck convinces her that such a conflict would inevitably harm gargoyles as well. So Demona agrees to steal the sword from Renard and not tell Xanatos of Puck's betrayal. But can she be trusted with it? Gargoyles, Millennium Sorrow Performed by Marina Surdis Written by Whitney Young Chapter 7 Demona felt mildly claustrophobic surrounded by her jagged metallic exoskeleton. Owen Burnett had modelled her suit after the robotic body that Xanatos had created for Cold Steel, her rookery brother, but the midsection and helmet were changed to account for Demona's female physique. She noticed that the propulsion boots made a particularly loud clanking noise whenever she stepped around in them. When she flexed her arms and hands, ailerons and small pistons popped and whirled. It's unnatural, she thought to herself. But what exactly was natural about a gargoyle who had entered into a Faustian pact with three witches to obtain immortality, wearing the robotic exoskeleton designed to encase the soul of her dead brother, flying in her own private helicopter to go steal a radioactive sword that could not only end her immortal existence, but the entire fairy population? Just another Tuesday for a perennially ambitious monocrat. Demona allowed the hint of a smirk to creep across her lips. She turned her attention to the yellow nuclear disposal unit in front of her. Through her metallic helmet, she used the optical sensors to zero in on the barrel. She aimed her metallic arm, and three ophidian silver tentacles extended out of her armor and slithered around the barrel. What would happen if Renard used the sword on one of the fairies that granted Demona immortality? Would their magic die with them? Would she die immediately? Or would she just revert to being a withered old crone? If there was one thing Demona wanted above all else, it was to always seem that weakness was an impossibility. Demona clenched her fist and the tentacles squeezed the cylinder like a boa constrictor. The steel groaned as it bent under the pressure, but Demona kept squeezing. She hammered the air with her fist, and the snakes dutifully slammed the cylinder onto the floor with a thud. She pretended the barrel was the corpse of Halcyon Renard, the stupid old man was so desperate for one final achievement to give his miserable life meaning that he had kicked off a supernatural civil war. Her slamming rocked the helicopter. The pilot's voice came through on the intercom. Is everything all right back there, Miss Destine? Never you mind, fool. Just have the chopper waiting for me at the 34th floor in 15 minutes. She opened the side of the helicopter. She could hear the wind wailing, but she couldn't feel it through her exosuit. She pressed the button on her arm and the jet engine in the back of the suit roared to life. Her legs and tail felt warm. Through her helmet, she could smell the kerosene as it burned at the exhaust. She took a leap of faith and rocket burst into hyperdrive. She felt her body press into the metal. Inside her helmet, 
readouts were projected onto the lenses that allowed her to look out into the real world. Streams of information on the status of the suit scrolled up and down. She arced and whistled over Manhattan skyscrapers like a torpedo. Power rumbled through her torso as she slowly got the hang of it. Renard's cyberbiotics building was fast approaching. With barely more than an arch of her back, the exosuit dipped down. The sword was being held on the 34th floor of a 70-story building. She pressed another button on the panel of her arm and the engine decelerated, shifting from flight to hover mode. From her arm, she ejected two devices. They exploded against the window, shattering the glass in a great ball of flames. Demona hovered through. Standing between her and the god killer was the great purple annoyance, the bane of her existence. Goliath, the so-called leader of this Manhattan clan of gargoyles, flanked on either side by two imposing steel clan robots. Fucking Tuesdays, she mumbled to herself. Abruptly, the mauve gargoyle's head snapped up. There was a shocked expression on his face. Demona. The faceplate of her helmet rose up, revealing her face. You were expecting someone else? What are you doing here? Goliath growled, clenching his fists. I don't suppose you'd believe me if I said that stealing the sword has nothing to do with my war on humanity, she offered nonchalantly with a sly smile secretly hoping he wouldn't believe her, so she could give him an excuse to attack. With you, there is always an ulterior motive. She had spent centuries working to free him from the curse that turned him to stone for a thousand years. Being betrayed by him was unthinkable. It had cut deeper than any god-killer sword ever could. He wasn't even resurrected for a day, before he began cavorting with that woman, a human. Low birth, no ambition. She wasn't even a fighter, merely a woman who investigated the crimes of other people. Elisa Maza was completely beneath Goliath, let alone Demona. He deserved to die for his betrayal, and Demona had tried. She'd come so close to killing him on multiple occasions but when it came down to it, she never seemed to be able to finish the job. Was there a part of her that wanted Goliath to live? To see the error of his ways? To finally become the leader she always knew he could be? She beat down such foolish notions. Goliath would die, eventually. And since gargoyles age significantly slower than humans... He would have to watch the two-bit detective wither and die before following suit. Inevitable suffering and then a lonely death would have to be punishment enough. For the sake of their daughter Angela, she had vowed not to kill Goliath, for it would all but destroy any chance of a potential reconciliation. But that doesn't mean I can't rough him up. Are you working for Renard now? Demona asked. Let me guess. You still feel guilty about how we crashed his little techno blimp, so you agreed to guard the sword, knowing nothing about it. I don't know who's the bigger lapdog, you or Bronx. Renard is a man of honor, which is more than I can say for you. But is he paying you? Minimum wage, even? <laughs> If you're desperate for work, my company is always hiring. I can get you a job with nighttime security. And we even have dental. She made sure to bare her fangs with an insincere smile. I won't let you have the sword. Good. She knew that when she fought her former mate, she wasn't just battling an adversary. She was battling the memory of what she used to be. Sentimental, naive, weak. But now she had an exosuit to counter Goliath's strength. She smiled 
and extended her hand, motioning for Goliath to come to her. She knew he'd fall for the obvious taunts. As expected, Goliath's eyes glowed white with rage. She knew that Goliath always went for the most obvious attack first, brute strength over strategy. As she predicted, he lunged straight for her, his arms outstretched, ready to tackle. With barely more than a twitch of her talons, the small propulsion jets in the armor beneath her feet ignited, propelling her to the right, narrowly evading Goliath's grasp. She spun around and grabbed Goliath's leg. She pulled him towards her and grabbed his arm with her other hand. And for the first time in a lifespan that has spanned more than a thousand years, she lifted Goliath over her head. He flailed around, but her grip was too tight. <laughs> no wonder Xanados loves these suits so much. She turned away from the sword and the android gargoyles and hurled Goliath into the wall. The gargoyle arced over the room, his back and wings creating a massive hole in the plaster wall. For a moment, it seemed as if he might be stuck there, but he slid to the floor eventually. I see why you're inclined to rely on brute strength. It definitely has its advantages, but over-dependence on brawn would inevitably leave a gargoyle to become rather... oafish. He looked up at her and sprang to his feet with preternatural speed. That got him. Goliath lunged for Demona again. This time when she tried to pivot, he swung his fist into her torso. A loud clang ran through the laboratory. Demona felt no pain, but the hit knocked her off the ground. The suit quickly compensated. She caught her bearings and hovered in the air. Goliath looked at the two large android gargoyles standing on either side of the sword. Their bodies were composed of grey armour with green accents, with black iron covering the tops of their robotic heads and the back of their necks, giving the illusion of a long black mane of hair. This, along with their sharp jawlines, gave the robots a passing resemblance to Goliath. She felt a thrill of excitement in knowing that she could destroy these creatures utterly without consequence. Stop her! The two great androids came to life. They both aimed their arms at Demona, laser cannons emerging from inside of each of their forearms. Demona saw the cannons glow with life, followed by a barrage of laser blasts. The engines beneath her feet propelled her and like a loose balloon, she darted all around the room, evading the blasts. But millions of dollars worth of equipment was turned to junk in a matter of seconds. Goliath attacked Demona from behind, delivering a flurry of punches to her back, several of which struck the main engine in her suit. The impact caused her to drop from the air, but she remained standing. She turned and blocked Goliath's attacks, and the two gargoyles danced across the room. With every dodge and parry, she made sure the robotic gargoyles wouldn't get a lock on her without injuring Goliath. With her reinforced helmet, she headbutted Goliath. He seemed dumbstruck and took several steps back before using his tail to steady himself. Demona flung herself at the dazed Goliath. Taking advantage, she grabbed him by the neck and spun him around, using him as a shield between her and the androids firing at her. When the Steel Clan robots detected Goliath in their sights, the firing ceased. Overwrite safety protocols! The first robot's jet engine whirled to life and it hurled itself at Demona like a heat-seeking missile. With the speed to match her own, it arced around and slammed into her side, narrowly missing Goliath. Demona lost her footing and let her ex-mate go. She crashed to the floor, and a spectacular cracking sound rang out as her body smashed into her suit's jagged metallic interior. Internal stabilizers offline, the suit warned her. No shit. 
The back of her head was throbbing and she could feel a warm trickle down her neck. It was more likely blood than sweat. She audibly told herself, get up. She felt too disoriented. She wasn't sure if she was seeing stars or if the suit was flashing lights in her face. Get up! She jumped to her feet and activated her boots. The android gargoyle was circling around the room, readying to make another pass. She flexed her claws, revved her engine. She traced the flight trajectory of the android and once the time was perfect, shot herself at it. She stretched out an arm. The silver tentacles emerged. When the two metallic bodies collided, the tentacles wrapped themselves around the robot's neck. She clenched her fist and pulled her arm towards her body with all her strength. The tentacles began to constrict. She shot away from the robot and the tentacles ripped the android gargoyle's head clean off. Sparks flew from exposed circuitry in the place where its head had been, and the body dropped to the ground. One down, one to go. She accelerated toward the remaining robot. It aimed at Demona and managed to get off a single shot that ricocheted off her armor. She slammed the android into the electric bars guarding the Ishtanulu sword. Klaxons went off inside her helmet, warning her of an impending energy surge. She jerked her hands away from the android. She watched as the laser currents from the electric bars surrounding the sword were more than enough to fry the circuitry of the second robot, which fell limp with smoke emitting from its various joints. The sword was now hers for the taking. But the Ishtanulu wasn't just glowing, it was pulsating. The pulses intensified and then abated, almost as if the sword were breathing. It emanated a haze of blue radiation which shimmered like the air above asphalt on a sweltering day. She extended her arm to take it. Through the armour, she could feel the sword resisting her, much like two polar opposite magnets trying to escape each other. Yet she persisted, forcing herself to clutch the hilt. Goliath dug his giant claws into the armour above her right forearm and ripped the plate right off, exposing the previously protected flesh. Demona felt a wave of pain travel through her arm, like a cobra's venom, the radiation sank into her skin, causing it to wither like an autumn leaf. She heard herself cry out in agony. Goliath's eyes widened as he watched the exposed skin desiccate. Demona seized upon the distraction. She spun around and landed her armoured tail into his back. He fell forward and she continued to hammer him repeatedly until he fell to the ground. Stay down, Goliath, she said, knowing he wouldn't. Not until he was unconscious. She hovered directly above him and then cut the engine off. The weight of her exosuit fell fully onto Goliath's upper back. His face hit the marble floor with a thud and Demona heard the wind leave his body. She extended the tentacles which wrapped themselves around the exposed sword. The silver snakes raised the sword up and away from her, even though the radiation still stung her skin. From inside the suit, she contacted the chopper. I've got what I came for. Be here in five minutes, she commanded. A laser blast cut right through the middle of her aphidian appendages and they fell dead to the ground, along with the sword. The tips of her severed tentacles emitted flares like Fourth of July sparklers. Speak of the demon, heralded a female voice with a strong Scottish accent. And she will appear. Demona turned around and saw them. Two figures stood at the doorway. Their black helmets had three red claw marks emblazoned on the front. The sigil of the hunters. Demona recognised that voice. Robin Canmore, 
Demona deigned with a simpering grin. Four years prior, Robin had come to work for Demona, posing as a ruthlessly ambitious, morally ambivalent executive assistant. However, Robin came from a long line of Scottish hunters, bigoted humans who had made it their mission to destroy all gargoyles whom they viewed as monsters. Each generation passed on that deranged mission to the next. Father was right. The demon wants the power for her own. Father? This perplexed Demona. She knew she had killed the Canmore father back in 1980. The fool had challenged her for a fight to the death at the top of Notre Dame Cathedral. He was little more than a temporary annoyance. As if reading Demona's thoughts, Robin added, Aye, and now we have the means to avenge him and all the humans you've killed. Before she could respond in kind, Goliath's belaboured voice interjected. Jason, you, you said you had changed. Demona looked back and saw Goliath standing on his feet. No, I just remembered who I really am and what filth you really are. Robin clenched her fist and a giant blade shot out of her armour just above her right wrist. Demona reached down and picked the sword up with her armoured hand. Pain flared from her arm to the rest of her body. It felt as if fire ants were trying to eat through her skin from the inside out, but she knew she could not show weakness. Demona held the sword firmly with her wrists locked. With her strength waning, she would let the hunters make the first move. Robin circled to Demona's right. She swung at Demona's head, but the gargoyle blocked. The singing sound of clashing metal rang out as their swords met. The huntress slid forward and slammed her shoulder into Demona's chest. The gargoyle grunted as she was pushed back. Robin swung up, cutting a half circle in the air, but Demona blocked again. The huntress leaned in and aimed for Demona's side. Demona blocked, but could feel herself stepping backwards. Robin was moving her into a corner. Demona kicked Robin in the chest. The hunter took the blow, driven back a step. It was enough. Demona stepped to her left, raised the guard killer, and hacked towards Robin's shoulder. The blades met and sparks jumped from the Ishtanulu. Demona swung again, and the sword sang as it sliced through the air. Although Demona felt herself getting weaker, the sword seemed to thrive off the combat. With each thrust and hack, the god killer seemed to take the burden off her. Now it was Robin who backpedaled. Demona raised the sword above her left shoulder and swung it horizontally at Robin's side. Another hunter bites the dust. But klaxons went off in her helmet before she could deal the final blow. Surge warning, surge warning. She was suddenly paralyzed. She felt the sword drop from her hand. Like a dead tree in the forest, her armored exosuit toppled over, taking Demona with her. Demona looked down and saw her armored body covered in an electrical net, which was blasting electricity into the armored suit, creating a power overload. Damn it! The other hunter had interfered using a craven contraption to save his duplicitous sister. Demona struggled to break free, but the net only constricted further. The energy in her suit was rapidly losing power. In a few seconds, it would be a metallic coffin. Emergency eject, Demona prompted. With its final thrust of power, the limbs and chest plate exploded off Demona, ripping through the metallic net. But when she stood, another wave of pain went through her body, more excruciating than before. She couldn't help but cry out as the venomous energy entered her core. An envelope of smouldering anguish shriveled her fingers and desiccated the rest of her flesh and organs. Her legs trembled, ready to give out, but refused to fall in front of these hunters. 
she looked back to Goliath, who was now on his feet. Her ex-husband's chiselled face was now a plaster of worry and revulsion as he regarded the crone before him. Her infirmities were laid bare for all to see. The humiliation hurt more than the physical pain sweeping through her decaying body. She peered down at the tiny shards of broken glass on the ground, unable to meet Goliath's gaze. But even those gave her no respite, because she saw herself there too. Without magic, you're nothing, demon the male hunter taunted as he aimed the god killer right at her. Survival instinct forced Demona to look at Canmore. A wave of rage crashed over her. If this were to be her end, she'd die like a gargoyle, taking at least one of the hunters with her. She still had her pride and a thousand years of rage to hurl at this bastard. I was killing your ancestors long before I became immortal, she shot back. The taunt worked. Face contorted with fury, the male swung the sword above his head to bring down on Demona, but she lunged straight for his raised arm. She bit his hand as hard as she could, her mouth filled with human blood. The radiation from the sword sent pulses upon pulses of acidic pain that rippled through her body, but she refused to let go. The hunter dropped the sword and kicked Demona off him. She fell to the ground. She saw the sword on the floor and scrambled towards it, but the human was faster. He snatched the sword and kicked Demona in the head, knocking her back down. She tried to stand but could only manage to get on all fours. There was no strength left in her. To die on her knees was unthinkable, and yet she felt paralysed. In the name of the Canmore family and in the name of all righteousness, I'm going to send you back to hell where you belong. No! Like a purple bolt of lightning, Goliath tackled the hunter, grabbing him in an unbreakable body lock. The two slammed into the wall and rolled across the floor. Goliath pinned the hunter down, chest heaving as the gargoyle gasped for air. I wanted to believe you had changed. Have you learned nothing from centuries of hate? <clears throat> Don't you see? She's using you. You're an instrument of evil. No better than she is. Goliath leaned his weight on the hunter even further. I'm only trying to go. Robin delivered a roundhouse kick to Goliath's head. When he turned around, the male took his chance. Sister! He flung the sword at her, and Robin grabbed the hilt midair. The sword was more than half her size, and yet she swung it around like a butter knife. The male hunter hit Goliath with an uppercut, causing Goliath to stumble back towards Demona. Goliath placed his arms out as if to guard her from the hunters. Goliath looked back at the withered crone before him. His eyes returned to normal, and Demona saw that they showed only pity. Over the years, his eyes had displayed love, admiration, lust, anger, rage, forbearance, but never pity. Robin continued to cut circles in the air. I'm going to enjoy this, she said with unadulterated hubris. Most people think that the word gargoyle comes from the Latin word gargola, meaning to gargle. Just fancy spouts on churches to alleviate rain. But my father always said that the word came from the first hunter who ran his sword through one of your offspring's necks and he gargled in his own blood as he lay dying on the ground. So amongst the Canmores, the word gargoyle is a promise of holy vengeance. Now tell me, gargoyle, when I run this sword through your family, Will you weep more for your daughter or your demonic whore of a wife? 
Demona looked up when she heard Goliath's guttural roar. <coughs> Robin was ready for his attack, and Demona knew he was about to do something stupid. Goliath, don't! She tried to yell, but all that exited her lips was an exhausted murmur. The gargoyle giant leapt towards the female hunter. The female raced towards Goliath as if she intended to meet him head on, but she dropped to her knees and slid forward. She went under Goliath and thrust the sword upward. Demona heard Goliath's skin shred like cheap leather ripping apart. Goliath fell to his knees and cradled the wound in his chest. The god killer was soaked in blood. He went completely still for a moment that felt like an eternity, a look of pain shock frozen on his face. He collapsed onto his side. Demona wanted to look away from the body of her beloved on the floor, but her gaze was chained in place. The whole world became Goliath or his impending absence. Goliath's inevitability had arrived all too soon. This has been Chapter 7 of Gargoyles, Millennium Sorrow, a forthcoming novel written by Whitney Young. It was performed by Marina Sartis with the voice talents of Gary Scales and Elliot Crossley. We hope you've enjoyed this broadcast, and we know that one day, gargoyles will live again.